As always, we hope to impart to you some useful automotive information and perhaps uh, provoke some automotive conversation on this uh, middle of June day. This is the last uh, last spring Saturday, right? Summer starts officially next uh, next week. So uh, enjoy your last Saturday and your last weekend of spring as uh, summer launches itself next week. We've got a lot of stuff we're going to talk about today, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, self-driving cars because it was in the news this week. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, when I did one of my auto quips, I, I was letting everybody know that uh, that Audi was going to be the first car company to be allowed to test an autonomous vehicle in New York State, and they were doing it in Albany, of all places, right? Albany, New York. So uh, basically, they took it. They took their Audi down to the state capitol and uh, literally drove it this week, or drove itself around the streets of Albany. Um, the good news is I think there was a, at least two engineers in the back seat of the car, so um, or one in the front, one in the back, while the car was driving itself. So it was never, you know, again, it was never too far out of uh, out of the range of a human, basically being able to uh, intervene. But uh, I was thinking to myself, well, if I had, if I was involved with this project, in other words, if I was one of the guys on the on the research team here working on this car. What would I be thinking about? Because right now, I mean, we've been focused on, uh, you know, this technology, and, and they make it sound like it's coming to town tomorrow, okay? But I can tell you what, they are a long, long way away from having it come tomorrow. And I think that because you see all the press that it's work, they're working on it, I think some people mistakenly think that uh, self-driving cars are going to be, you know, you're going to be ordering them pretty soon online or something. And... uh I, I think they're a long ways away, and we're going to talk about some of the reasons why I think that is. But first of all, I was reading about Google's challenges uh, with the handoff between man and machine, so to speak. I mean, Uber had some problems during its recent test drive in San Francisco. So there, there's a ton of work that has to be done before these cars are ready for mainstream. But there's a whole bunch of issues that that I wonder how they're going to deal with. Stuff that you and I deal with as a matter of course every single day. So I'll give you some of the, the things that are on my mind and you could you could think about these. For example, if you're driving down the street and you pull up to a stop sign and a pedestrian's stepping off the curb, right? And you're sitting there watching that person and the person makes eye can- contact with you and you know what's going to happen next, right? Either you're going to move or they're going to move. Well, how's the car going to make eye contact with a person? Or better yet, there's other subtle things that happen with with people between people. I'll give you another example. Let's say you're driving down a little side street, and there's a car in front of you who, that stops in front of a house, for whatever reason. They don't pull over, but they stop, <clears throat> and they... You see the brake lights come on, so basically you stop, slow down, and you're wondering what the person's doing, right? The next thing you know, they put their hand out the window and they wave you around them. You say, oh, okay, you're going to sit there. So you look to see if there's anything coming, then you kind of slowly make your way around that that other vehicle and you head out of there. Well, how would a self-driving car know about being waved around? I mean, basically it uses a technology like LiDAR, which is laser radar, and it knows there's a vehicle in front of it. It's not going to know if the if the guy's going to move or stay there. And I don't think it's going to read the hand gesture of, of driving around it, right? Or imagine if uh, all of a sudden you see a police officer walk out into the medium and they're kind of just telling you to go into the next lane. Or, or a construction guy, they're putting cones out. And they're not ready to, to close the lane, but they're you're gesturing to you to move over a little bit. You know, these are these things that, you know, body language of a, of a traffic control officer or, or a bicyclist making eye contact. I mean, how do you teach a computer human intuition? Now, obviously, the only way is probably endless hours of road testing so the machine can learn from the interactions that humans have been socialized to understand since you were born, so to speak. But, I mean, how do we actually do that? One of the other problems that I see for these cars is is driving uh, safely despite unclear lane markings. I thought of this the other day um, when I was 
watching out in Court Street down by my office, and, uh, and they were putting temporary paint markings on the road to open the lanes back up. I use the word temporary because uh, they're not done paving it, but they're done milling it. So what they've done is they've milled the road, and they've put some temporary markers in the line uh, on the street so that cars can see which side of the street they're on. Well, you know those those markers are pretty faint. Um, so the question that I wonder is, I was wondering about, well, how do you uh, make decisions without clear white lines? You know, you put these little little dots in the middle of the road, for example, like those little plastic lanes that the little plastic bumps that mark lanes. Um, you know, how does it how does it know that there's no more white lines in the road? I don't know how these cars do that. Uh, and interestingly, those those little Dots that you see on the road, they're called BOTS dots. Little plastic bumps that mark lanes, they're called BOTS dots, B-O-T-T-S dots. And uh, <clears throat> California was looking to phase those babies out because um, automated vehicles cannot discern them from debris in the road. <laughs> in other words, this, the highway infrastructure is going to have to change over time to interact with computer-driven vehicles. Those BOT dots are used every place. And I'll give you another good example. Imagine a uh, traffic light in front of your street doesn't work. Happens all the time, right? Well, how do you, you know, you can pick out a light that, that's been, that's, you know, worked all, all along, and next thing you know, it's out, it doesn't work. So how's a self-driving car's vision system going to know that the light doesn't work? In other words, it's, it's, it's designed to read the light. Well, what if there is no light? And it's an intersection. Again, you have to teach a machine, human intuition, how to cooperate with multiple vehicles trying to go through the intersection with it, where a situation where, is, again, cars are looking at each other and somebody's waving somebody else on, right? Well, how do you, how's that going to work with an automated car? I think one of the other tasks that I think is most difficult is making left turns into intersections with fast-moving traffic. Now, if you want to merge into a rapidly flowing lane of traffic, it's a very, very delicate task, actually, and it often requires a lot of eye contact with oncoming drivers. So how could a machine subtly let other machines and humans know what they're trying to do? Well, that's one of the reasons why they want to have car-to-car communications, where basically, um, you know, imagine, and I always use the words like a, a, a school of fish. If you watch a school of fish on TV move about, they're all in unison going at the same speed. Very, very efficient, by the way, way of doing things. And the thought process is if cars can talk to each other, they can manage each other in traffic and move like a school of fish. Which, by the way, would would really be a boon to to traffic because the cars would move much more efficiently. But if you know one percent of the cars are equipped this way and the rest aren't, it's not going to work. So it's going to be very very long time before car to car communication is something that is is throughout the fleet, so to speak. And if you think that the average vehicle on the road today is eleven, almost twelve years old. And none of them today are equipped that way. And if, if the average is 12 years old, that means it's just as many older as there is newer. So in other words, it's going to take at least 20 years if, if it started today before all the cars on the road were able to talk to each other. That's why when you, when you hear about this technology and it's taking up so much square footage in newspaper stories, and on news reports, and on TV, and online, and it all it all sounds great, and, and it'll work. I do believe that they'll figure it out. But uh, when you get into traffic with other vehicles and human beings and other cars that are not equipped the same way, I, I think that's going to be very, very difficult. I think another problem that they're going to have is detecting small objects in the roadway that must be avoided. So, you know, we talked about those, those little bot dots a few moments ago, well, what happens if there's a soda can in the road? How's how's the computer going to see that? Um, and, we'll, and let's say the soda can is blowing across the road because there's a wind. Well, the car is liable to interpret that as as somebody or something running in front of the car, 
and literally snot, you know, slam on the brakes to stop to avoid it. I'm not so sure the car is going to be looking at this thing and saying, okay, I'm going to drive, I'm going to shift a little bit to the left here and drive over the middle of it. You follow me? Like you or I would do. Um, I don't think it's going to do that very well. So what's its choice is going to be? That's a question. And, of course, there's the problem of, of operating in all weather conditions. You know, we talk about LADAR, which is really short for light detection and ranging technology, uh, would, would be helpful. But LIDAR systems are good because they can't be fooled by darkness or sun glare. But LIDAR has problems in the rain or the snow. So when we talk about being in heavy rain or snow, that can confuse the current radar and LIDAR systems that they're testing now in cars, which would make it necessary you know, for a driver to intervene. So you know, these are some of the problems. And, of course, the last one that really concerns me is cybersecurity. Because I have not seen any evidence that an autonomous car is any more secure than any other network computer. Obviously, a self-driving car is nothing more than a collection of networked computers and sensors working together, right? And then working together with the outside world. Well, keeping the system safe from intruders who, you know, might want to do something horrible to the car sounds like something that from a science fiction movie. But look what happens now. Almost a week doesn't go by without hearing some story about some major corporation's uh, software being being uh, attacked or, or somebody's credit card information being hacked or stolen. Uh, you know, there's people who do mischievous things for just no more reason than they're, they're anarchists. Well, imagine uh, being able to, to hack your car and really deal with that. So, you know, we talk about the, the nice news story that there's an autonomous car rolling around the streets of Albany. Um, I could tell you that I I think we're very very long ways away from being in a, in a position where um, you're going to have a truly driverless car without a steering wheel hitting the market. And in the meantime, um, I think all the technologists who are working on these things are going to have to keep figuring things out. Uh, I think certain features of driverless car are going to be useful in a shorter period of time. Uh, I said before, for example, um, if, if, you know, right now, you know, Ford makes a product where the car will park itself, um, and it works. It works well. Um, so that same technology allows it to park in a parking lot, or on a street, rather, or a curb, will probably allow it to park itself in a parking lot with other cars. Um, I would think that at some point, the car will have a feature where you press a button, and if the car is on the other side of the parking lot, it'll come to you like a dog. You'll press, you'll press a button, and your car will come to you. That might be pretty handy in the rain. Because I think if the car is good enough to park itself between a couple of parked cars at, at two or three miles an hour, I think it could probably find its way to your key fob the exact same way using the exact same sensors. Or conversely, the car drops you off in front of the store and goes parks itself. Those are the things I think you're going to see sooner than later. But I think as far as getting in a car that doesn't have a steering wheel and, uh, you know, picking up the, the morning paper and reading it while the car takes you someplace, that's going to be quite a while. I think we've got a few decades left that we can enjoy actually driving. 